My name is Ben Klebanoff. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Emory Law Journal, and I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to this uh, very special symposium, symposium, the National Labor Relations Board, after 80 years. The, the decisions and actions of the board have drawn increased scrutiny in the modern era, and even more so in the wake of President Obama's efforts to ensure that the board has been comprised of a full contingent of its members. But even before President Obama was elected, because the board primarily develops its rules through adjudications, its decisions have been quite controversial, no doubt in part as a result from the lack of the legislative changes to guide the agency's decisions over the past 40 years. The board's effectiveness as it reaches its 80th anniversary this year represents an important legal question and a major concern for all of those interested in labor law. And we are pleased to present for your consideration an array of perspectives which will consider these and other important questions. In accord with our longstanding tradition of memorializing events like this symposium, the discussions, debates, and ideas presented here today will be memorialized in published form in a special issue of the Emory Law Journal, which will be available in the next few weeks. This event would not be possible without the efforts of many people, and I want to take a minute to briefly recognize some of the many individuals who made this day possible. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Ford and Harrison for their generous support and their sponsorship of this event, without which the, this event would simply not have occurred. And the Labor and Employment section of the Georgia Bar with their assistance for publicizing this event. Um, this event would also not have been able to take place without the support we received from Vice Dean Adier, uh, Joelle Arisic, Robert Jackson, Professor Shaner, Eric Jackson, and Alyssa Ashton for their efforts to help make this event a reality and for their support of the journal. And I want to especially thank Professor Michael Green, uh, who approached us with the idea for this event and eagerly worked with us to make it successful. It has been a true pleasure to work with you, and we are very humbled that you so willingly worked with us and to help make this event come to fruition. And of course, to all of our panelists and guests um, whose participation in this event has drawn everyone here, and we'll draw more people in later today. Um, and finally, to the staff of the Emory Law Journal, um, with a special note of thanks to the executive board, especially um, Gerard Bufoco, the outgoing executive symposium editor, and Katya Karmachiva, uh, the incoming executive symposium editor, um, for their efforts behind the scenes to make this event possible. And with that, we're going to just get started. So, uh, Mr. Wil Professor Wilson, take, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brent Wilson. I'm with the law firm of Ellaby Thompson, Sapp and Wilson, and I'm adjunct here at Emory teaching labor law. Uh, unfortunately, my students don't love me. <laughs> they have a tendency to criticize me. <laughs> uh, but uh, it has been a, a, a fun ride. Uh, given the opportunity to introduce this panel, I started to think about my journey uh, in the labor law field. I was speaking to the ch chairman, and when we were in law school, uh, I probably had absolutely no idea that I would gravitate to labor law. I was just fortunate enough to take a labor law course, and at the uh, end of that semester, I applied for summer internships. I had, I had two primary motivations when I was in law school. One, I wanted a job paying more than $10,000 a year, and two, I wanted a job. <laughs> so when I was uh, given the opportunity to work as an intern at the NLRB, I jumped right on it. I, I had offers from the Army JAG uh, to go to Heidelberg, Germany, and from the NLRB to work in Region 6 in Pittsburgh. And when I spoke to B. Fred Toback, who was the executive director of the NLRB, and asked him why I should take the NLRB job, he informed me that the board had hired approximately 25 summer interns the previous summer, and they made permanent offers to 22 of them. So I said, I like those odds, and I'll take the NLRB job. So I uh, started there. then after law school, worked in Region 10 under Curtis Mack for about three years and have been in private practice in Atlanta ever since. Uh, during that period of time, I've had an opportunity to learn a little bit about some of the icons in the labor law area. And I am humbled and very pleased to introduce to you uh, four of those people who are here on this panel this morning. Uh, 
Julius Getman uh, is the Earl Sheffield Regents Chair Emeritus at the University of Texas Law School. He is a preeminent scholar in the field of labor law. He has written multiple books and he has edited a book of essays with former Secretary of Labor Ray Marshall entitled The Future of Labor Unions, Organized Labor in the 21st Century. Professor Getman did not prepare a paper for, the special, for this seminar, but his lecture will focus on the challenges the NLRB has faced politically. After hearing from Professor Getman, we will hear from Theodore J. St. Antoine. He's the James E. and Sarah A. Deegan Professor of Law Emeritus at the University of Michigan. Uh, he graduated from Michigan and in 65 joined the Michigan faculty and was Dean of the Michigan Law School in 1971, holding that post until 1978. He is a experienced labor arbitrator for over 40 years, was president of the National Academy of Arbitrators, received numerous awards, and is co-editor of a leading labor law casebook, currently in its 12th edition. Uh, Professor St. Antoine will talk about the NLRB's role vis-a-vis -vis the courts. After hearing from Professor St. Antoine, we'll hear from Charlotte Garden. I had the opportunity to work with Charlotte uh, in Seattle at the Pacific Coast Labor Law Conference. Uh, she's a professor at Seattle University School of Law where she serves as the litigation director at the school's Korematsu Center for Law and Equality. Her scholarship focuses on labor movement and the First Amendment. Prior to joining Seattle faculty, uh, she was a practicing public interest attorney, working as an associate with a labor law side firm. She will focus her comments on a shot across the bow politics, and the Obama board. Finally, um, our last speaker will be Professor William B. Gould IV. Professor Gould is the Charles Beardsley Professor of Law Emeritus at Stanford Law School. He is an influential academic of labor and discrimination law. He served as chairman of the National Labor Relations Board from 1994 to 1998 where he played a critical role in ending the longest strike in baseball history. He has been a member of the National Academy of Arbitrators since 1970 and has arbitrated and mediated over 300 labor disputes. He is a prolific scholar, having authored 10 books and over 60 law, reviews, law review articles. Professor Gould's comments will focus on politics and the effect on the NLRB's adjudicative process. It is with great pleasure that I have the opportunity to invite these panel participants to share their knowledge with you. I ask you to please listen carefully and intently uh, to question them because they do have all the answers. <laughs> Professor Getman, thanks. Well, it, it, it's certainly a pleasure to be here and to be part of this panel with my distinguished colleagues. Um, and I will, for, uh, for 80 years, national labor policy as set forth in the National Labor Relations Act has been committed to overcoming, quote, the inequality of bargaining power between employees and employers by encouraging the practice and procedure of collective bargaining and by protecting the exercise by workers of full freedom of association, self-organization, and designation of representation. And the basic tenets of national policy could be restated in terms of a series of commands directed at the NLRB in the courts, which would be stated as follows. One, promote and protect the right of workers, promote being an important part of this, the right of workers to organize for the purpose of collective bargaining. Two, prevent employers from using their economic power to inhibit, inhibit free choice by workers. Three, leave the parties, labor and management, free to negotiate their own agreements. And four, 
recognize and protect the right of strike, the right to strike, which from the beginning of the act until now has been given a special place in the National Labor Relations Act. Well, if you listen to those goals and look at our current reality, you see an enormous gulf between what the law set out to do and still remains its, its stated goal and where we are now with collective bargaining sh shrinking, the union movement uh, sh shrinking in size. And uh, so one wonders, how did we get here? Because we, there was an elaborate right, procedure set up by the National Labor Relations Act that was centered on the, the National Labor Relations Board. And so the key to turning those commands into a living reality was the establishment of the NLRB as an expert agency that was to use its understanding of labor relations reality to establish national policy. And subject, the initial idea, was subject to minor and supportive review by the courts. Right. And when extremely complex issues arise, you get the Supreme Court as the final arbiter, but certainly not the basic setter of policy. Now, the positive vision of an expert board and a supportive court has been supplanted by the reality of an activist court, ignorant, and I would stress the word ignorant, of labor relations making policy decisions, many in conflict with the basic concepts of the National Labor Relations Act. And the board has become a controversial, often politicized agency whose best efforts are denounced by politicians and often overruled by the Supreme Court. Thus, when the board, a few years ago, issued a complaint against the Boeing company, after Boeing had basically announced in a series of, state, of public statements that it had committed an unfair labor practice, and the, the board acting general counsel issued a complaint, it was denounced by politicians and commentators endlessly and unfairly. So the start off uh, has what's happened in the legal realm. Now, in many of my writings, which I'm not going to repeat today, I have pointed out that the labor movement bears a considerable responsibility for its own demise. But, uh, but the board has had help, uh, but the labor movement has had uh, help in, uh, in its demise from the process that was set up by the National Labor Relations Act, and particularly I think in the role of the Supreme Court. If you look at the su key Supreme Court decisions, as I say, they're marked by a bias and ignorance. Um, and, the and the latter cuts across the, the politics of the court. So the, if you look at the key elements which w of, of uh, what unions do, it is organizing collective bargaining and striking as an adjunct to collective bargaining. But organizing, of course, is first, is the primary effort of unions, at least that's so they say. The greatest problem today is organizing, and the Sup Supreme Court has played a major role in constructing the current system under which employers have immediate and constant opportunity to make the case against unions to its employees, and the NLRB is forbidden to grant union organizers the, the right to come to the parking lot to speak to the employees. In the in its gene country decision, the board attempted a sensible and modest effort to balance the section seven rights of employees with the property rights of employers. And one theme that runs through the court's opinions, which wasn't supposed to be a part of the National Labor Relations Act, is a tremendous deference to property rights. Uh, so in its key ruling on access, Leachmere versus the NLRB, the Supreme Court rejected the board's effort to balance the degree, the, quote, the degree of impairment of the Section 7 right if access should be denied against the degree of impairment of the property right. The Supreme Court said basically in an opinion by Justice 
Clarence Thomas, which was not one of his best. And I think that's making a statement. In the study, so the Supreme Court denied that, and they pointed out that the NLRA confers rights only on employees, but not on unions. But when you think about it, how are the employees going to exercise their right to make an informed choice? And part of the policy of the National Labor Relations Act is free and informed choice. Well, how are they going to make that decision without learning the union's case? In the study that I did many years ago with Professors Goldberg and Brett on union uh, elections and labor board elections, a, a study who remains controversial to this day, but what isn't controversial is in the fact that we did a, uh, a, a schedule to, de to determine what parts of the campaigns the employees remembered. And of course they remembered the employer's campaign much more than the union campaign, and that was absolutely correlated with attendance at meetings, and they didn't go to union meetings largely because they didn't have the time, they were held in, uh, at the wrong hours or in places that were difficult to get to. So the employers had at that time a significant advantage since then, and as the way organizing has developed, that advantage has increased because employers more and more, if there is a union election, set aside everything, meet with the employees on a regular basis, deliver captive audience speeches, which any expert in the field could write you know, with, with ease, but they make important points which need to be refuted and the union never gets to refute them. So I have no doubt that one of the most important case decisions by the Supreme Court was the decision to deny the board the power to even grant any access to union organizers. And Justice Thomas said, well, we, there is a balance. The union has to be able to make its, uh, to let the employees know that it's around. But he said they could do that. They could put up a sign on the roadway saying union organizing campaign in process. That, of course, compared to a captive audience speech, does not really sound like anything approaching balance. Uh, and the various other decisions by the Supreme Court, the most significant of, of, of the decisions by the Supreme Court wasn't exactly a decision, right? It was the dictum in the McKay case in which they said you can permanently replace striking workers. Now, curiously, the, this dictum was irrelevant to the decision of the case. The decision of the case actually stands for the proposition that employers cannot single out people or deny reinstatement on the basis of union activity. There were four employees who were, who'd been on a strike, they'd been active in the union, the employer refused to reinstate them. The court said, no, you can't use, that's the holding of the McKay case. So that's decided in 1937 or nine. Or but the Supreme Court said you cannot, in its holding, you can't single out people based on union activity. Then it issues this statement in the McKay case saying, but they are permitted to permanently replace the, the strikers, which is, of course, doing exactly what the court holding said they couldn't do. Okay, now when the Supreme Court decided the McKay, dis issued the McKay dictum, which has been the law now for, you know, close to 80 years, when they issued it, you could imagine why they may have made such a statement. But for the 80 years since, they've never examined it. And it's actually inconsistent with several of their own of their own holdings, as the case of Erie Resistor, which experts in board law realized they went through saying what an employer couldn't do. Every, every point that the court made was relevant to re replacement workers as well. So by denying access to the union, by permitting employers to permanently replace workers, the court has dealt the policies in the National Labor Relations Act a very power, powerful blow. Now, at the time the court dis decided 
or, or the time the court issued its dictum, in, which is known as the McKay Doctrine, maybe they thought that unions didn't need the kind of help from the law because the union movement was thriving and so on. But in fact, because of that rule, the strike often went from being a union weapon to being an employer weapon. And, and if the strike isn't a potent union weapon, then the whole collective bargaining system fails. And the court also denied to the board the power to in any way remedy failures on employer to bargain. So the court has played an ignominious role, uh, uh, as I say, ignorance often being. For example, in what was at the time thought to be a pro-labor decision on arbitration, the court announced that the no-strike clause in the agreement is the quid pro quo for the arbitration clause, and you're supposed to read the two of them together. Now, anybody who's ever negotiated knows that that's absolutely not the case because the no-strike clause is the quid pro quo for everything the employer grants. But this became an established fact once the Supreme Court announced it. You realize when you read through its opinions that the court has the ability to establish facts. And then other cases cite this case which established that fact. And then you decide cases on the basis of the now well-established legal fact of the no strike clause being the quid pro quo for the arbitration clause. It makes no sense whatever. Um, and the role of the federal courts has itself not been uh, very helpful. Now the board itself has been complicit in, its, in the loss of its power and in a variety of ways. Um, part of it uh, part of it is that the board really never, I think, has become quite as expert as it was supposed to be. Uh, thank you. The board, uh, and I think they focused on the wrong issues. For example, in organizing, the amount of time that has been spent on parsing employer speech to determine whether what an employer says is a threat or not, to my mind, is an, an enormous amount of wasted time. I, I, I'm, I think somebody described me as being almost unique among pro-union uh, academics in believing that employers are entitled to a, a greater amount of free speech in union representation elections. The Supreme Court curiously backed the board in the Gissel case by, by establishing a very limited right of employers to speak about the consequences of unionization. And so the, it's sort of the balance for denying organizers the right to enter the premises is in limiting what employers may say, but it's a terrible balance. It works out very much in the employer's basis because limiting employer speech is, has been totally ineffective, largely because employers really don't win elections by threatening employees. And we have, we being Goldberg and Brett and myself, have the data set which I think can establish that and besides which, when you, th when you think about it, I don't want to go into this too, too, uh, too great length, but even if employees who feel threatened by the employer, the idea that they will therefore vote against the union which they otherwise support makes no sense. So I think the board has wasted a, a great deal of time. It has also been overly technical in some of its opinions. Its opinions on AP7 and um, what constitutes picketing, I think, are, are, are rather s stunning. You know, we have one, one person holding up a sign, and that's picketing. And the Supreme Court has also, at least up to now, uh, separated labor picketing from every other kind of picketing. So you could have the Hillsborough Baptist Church 
picketing a funeral of a Marine with signs saying God hates fags and the Supreme Court says that's the First Amendment, we love it. But you have labor unions with signs saying don't cross, we're on strike and the court says that's not speech, that's more than speech, that's something else. And they, they have, it's still uh, the last word from the court on labor picketing is that somehow it's less entitled to protection than the, the protection that the Hillsborough Baptist Church gets. Why that is, I don't know. And I would, uh, going out of turn, urge that the labor board really needs, we, we need to have another test. If the court is as committed to the First Amendment as it says, and to treating picketing as an element of free speech, then uh, it ought to really rule much of the secondary boycott and, uh, and Section AP7 dealing with recognitional picketing as unlawful. Um, now, very quickly, I, I've tried to paint as dismal a picture as I see when I look at the legal system in terms of labor relations. But a minute on what can we do anything? Well, I, uh, it's very difficult. You know, a fair number of union leaders have said just abolish the National Labor Relations Act. Well, I think that's, that would be a foolish thing to do because as someone living in Texas, I would hate to see the Texas legislature free to en enact its own labor policy or virtually almost any other policy. Uh, so we'd be turning, we'd be turning the whole business over, and, and in, in, particularly in the South, which is where unions need to need to organize. Uh, the only other suggestion I'm I think the the labor board, and this, by the way, without uh, uh, sucking up, I will say this is an unusually good labor board, and the board should really think about ways to help it develop the kind of expertise which the courts regularly announce that they have and then pay no attention to. The, the board has, you know, you know the, the board in all its years has never kind of permitted testimony about the actual impact uh, of employer unfair labor practices. Now that makes perfect sense, but I would, I would wish that the board would, I would wish that the board would try to develop some studies on its own, invite in social scientists. I think there is a possibility of the board becoming more expert than it has been. Uh, you, you really don't become an expert necessarily about how employees are going to re react to a situation um, by being appointed to the board. And even if you had experience as a lawyer or experience uh, as an academic, certainly, for the most part, you, you don't know. But the board, I think, would do itself and the whole uh, practice of labor law a favor by making an effort to, uh, to use its institutional ability to learn more and to invite in people who um, are knowledgeable about the kinds of dynamics that take place uh, in, a union, in a union election. And with that, I will stop. Thank you, Professor Getman. Professor St. Antoine. Good morning. Morning. Before uh, getting underway with my presentation, uh, I'd just like to say a few words. I hope I can speak for all my colleagues in this, in uh, thanking Emory both for putting together this uh, splendid program. A word to have uh, for the presence of all the members of the National Labor Relations Board and its general counsel. And this is an extraordinary feat. I'm not sure I can recall this. It, anything other than an occasional American Bar Association meeting, and uh, to the wonderful editing that I've been subjected to. I initially resented, outrageous, the notion that they were going to put us through five separate edits, and every time they find something that I did wrong. 
So uh, I, uh, I am most appreciative of all that as well. My subject uh, is going to be uh, the relationship between the courts uh, and the National Labor Relations Board. There will be some overlap with uh, what has already been said by Jack Getman. Uh, I like to think that if you hear something of the same sort from uh, two people as ancient, if not necessarily as learned as the two of us, uh, it will carry some weight in uh, your evaluation of the soundness of our uh, assessments. I can't, I'm not going to burden you with the whole history of the fluctuating attitudes of the courts toward administrative rulings, but I cannot resist uh, starting off by pointing out that way back to that uh, great constitutional decision of Marbury against Madison, that was essentially a matter of a judicial review of an administrative determination. And uh, John Marshall said that's the law of the courts. It's, it's, it's the uh, duty of the courts. It's the function of the courts to apply the law. And uh, there have been some varying attitudes by the judiciary ever since. And that's part of what I'm going to be talking about. But let me be very broad and let you worry about to reading my published piece as to the details. It started off uh, that uh, the courts really began a kind of de novo review of administrative decisions, and then there developed what you can call more of an appellate approach. And uh, then when uh, the uh, great administrative uh, business of the 20th century began, uh, there, were, there was more systematization of the standards of judicial review. There was a famous case of Skidmore against Swift. Skidmore against Swift in 1944, uh, at which the courts, uh, the Supreme Court, really laid down the notion that you looked at the rationality, the thoroughness, uh, the uh, consistency uh, of the administrative determinations. You took a variety of factors uh, into account in determining uh, whether the uh, decision of the administrative agency should be sus uh, sustained. And then just two years later came what should have been, I think, uh, the definitive determination in a, a law of Congress passed unanimously, if you could believe such a thing, the Administrative Procedure Act. And the Administrative Procedure Act spelled out very definitely that reviewing courts shall decide all relevant questions of law. And uh, that uh, would seem to uh, uh, make a very significant uh, uh, basis for future actions by the courts. Except for the most part, as far as I can tell, whatever the Supreme Court thinks uh, it wants to do so, it uh, blithely ignores that uh, uh, statement and either does or does not give a very significant weight, even on uh, statutory matters, uh, to the determination by the administrative agency. So there really is a good deal of fluctuation here. Uh, one could say that, uh, oh, for roughly 40 years or so, Skidmore, that sort of multifaceted approach to judicial review, uh, prevailed. But then along came the case that many think is the most significant administrative uh, ruling of uh, the late uh, 20th century, and that's the famous Chevron case, the Chevron case. And in Chevron, the Supreme Court uh, stated that, uh, of course, if Congress's uh, law is clear, the courts must follow it. But if it is silent on the particular issue before the administrative agency, or if the law is ambiguous, if the law is ambiguous, uh, then the court should defer to the determination of the administrative agency Assuming that the determination of the agency uh, is a permissible, is a permissible construction uh, of the statute. Now notice the way the Supreme Court phrased it. It was in rather absolute terms. It simply said, uh, if the uh, uh, law is silent or ambiguous, uh, then uh, the agency's determination should be deferred to, accepted, uh, as long as its construction of the statute is a permissible one. I would say that 
in reality, uh, there has actually been a somewhat different theme pervading all these years. And I would phrase it something like this, that if it's a pure question of law, if it's a pure question of law, that, and, and this is really going right back to John Marshall and Marbury against Madison, the court's determination should prevail. Forget about what the administrative agency did. If it is a pure question of law, on the other hand, uh, if it's what you might regard uh, as an application of law to the particular facts of a situation, it's there that the administrative agency should stand foremost. It's the expert in this particular area, and it's applying law to particular facts. And those themes, it seems to me, pure law for the courts, regardless of what the agency did. Law applied to particular facts, that's the domain where the agency should be given greatest deference. And it seems to me that uh, you put that together with all the variations over the years, and that distinction uh, carries a great deal of sense to it. Uh, it actually was set forth uh, by what I would regard as a a great realist thinker in administrative law, John Dickinson, many years ago, way back in the 19th century, uh, who spelled out, I thought, uh, a good hard-headed realist, if the, if the matter that's being determined is something that the law, the courts conclude, is really going to be of such importance that it ought to be applied in future cases as precedent, then it's a matter for the courts. Uh, that's realistic. If it really is that significant, we're not going to let an administrative agency deal with it. It's going to be decided by the courts. Now, uh, to make a few comments about uh, overall assessment, uh, I would make that as number one, that pure legal questions are primarily for the courts, the questions of applying the law to particular facts, they're the greatest deference in judicial review should be given to the administrative agency. Another matter of realism that I should mention, this is based upon a study by Professor Thomas Miller and Cass Sunstein, uh, a tough-minded review. If the administrative agency's decision uh, is relatively liberal over 70% of Democratic judges will sustain it. It will be sustained 72, I, I, I misstate, misspoke. 72% of the time it will be supported by administrative judges. Republican judges will sustain a liberal administrative ruling only about 58% of the time. Conversely, uh, if it's a conservative decision Republican judges will sustain it over 70% of the time, and Democratic judges will sustain it only about 55% of the time. That is hard-headed realism. We can talk in a moment about whether it's good or bad. One of our future panelists, uh, Jeffrey Hirsch, on a somewhat different approach to legal realism, uh, has offered what I think are some very good advice uh, to the National Labor Relations Board. It's too bad more of the staff members aren't here, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, on this. Uh, the briefs ought not to deal with all the procedural technicalities as the introduction. Get to the heart of the case. Get to the facts immediately. Emphasize, where appropriate, uh, the deference that reviewing courts should give to administrative decisions. Spell it out. Uh, not all judges are experts in uh, the doings of the National Labor Relations Board, but do emphasize, and of course there are some decisions that go the other way, but emphasize the decisions of the Supreme Court that have given considerable deference uh, to the administrative decisions. And uh, uh, Write with a little 
color uh, in your briefs. Don't make them dry as dust. And uh, it seems to me that all of these are good practical suggestions. I start off with that first one. Uh, you often see the uh, NLRB decision itself as sort of taking care of the procedural niceties at the outset of the opinion. Now, nobody pays any attention to that, but they get it out of the way. But that's not the way to start a brief for a reviewing court. Get down to the substantive business. Uh, what really happened here, and why should the NLRB's decision prevail? I'm now going to uh, say a few words about some individual decisions, and uh, you will see my bias coming through, I suspect, uh, as I discuss a case that applied the court's view because this really was a pure question of law, and other cases where the court did or did not uh, in situations where I think it was a matter of the application of law to particular facts, the domain of the NLRB, uh, I, uh, uh, I probably will display some of my bias as to how these different types of cases uh, should be handled. But let me, as a preliminary note, uh, mention to you some basic consideration uh, that uh, really uh, needs to be taken into account. Uh, it, it presents something of a puzzlement uh, to both the agency and uh, to the reviewing courts, and it's this. The Wagner Act, the initial National Labor Relations Act, uh, was adopted in the middle of the Great Depression. Uh, there was a need for working people to be encouraged uh, to better themselves, get better wages, hours, and working conditions. There was a strong pro-union attitude on the part of the people, of the government, of the Congress, and the National Labor Relations Act initially was clearly a pro-union law. It is, it's spelled out in so many words. It is the policy of the United States to encourage the practice of collective bargaining. There were only, union, uh, only employer unfair labor practices. There were no union unfair labor practices. And you see that as the starting point in American union management relations as regulated uh, by the federal law. Twelve years later, there was a very different attitude. The Republicans had taken over both houses of Congress. Uh, there was a wave of strikes that swept the country following the Second World War. And uh, Senator Taft, the leading authority on the uh, Taft-Hartley Act, the Labor Management Relations Act, which amended the National Labor Relations Act in 1947, he said, our purpose here is to provide a balance of power uh, between unions and management. Now unions, as well as employers, were subject to unfair labor practice provisions. Uh, indeed, unions and some of the secondary boycott provisions were singled out for restrictions that did not have a counterpart with regard to management. A very different attitude. And yet, despite a specific effort to uh, withdraw that language with regard to the encouragement of collective bargaining, it was retained after being debated and disputed. So there still is a provision in there. It is the policy of the United States to encourage the practice of collective bargaining. So anyone trying to bring a philosophy to bear on today's world in union management relations certainly has a kind of uh, parallel vision that there is to be balance in the approach. One could argue that the federal government should actually be neutral in the dealings between union and management, but at the same time, uh, there was that underlying attitude that was never repealed. It is, the it is the policy of the United States to encourage the practice of collective bargaining. Let me deal with about uh, four specific cases. The initial start The initial start is who is an employee under the National Labor Relations Act, obviously. 
<clears throat> there have been some very controversial cases over the years. Uh, two that I will mention uh, was the Kentucky River case in which the board had concluded that registered nurses, even though they may have had some uh, uh, incidental, uh, incidental supervisory responsibilities with other aides and so on, uh, that they were still employees. By a five to four decision, uh, the Supreme Court overruled that and concluded there were supervisors who were specifically excluded, excluded from the definition of employees. Another case closer to uh, some of our hearts on this panel uh, was the, the Ashiva case. Again, the Labor Board concluded that employees in the university who wanted to organize uh, the faculty members were employees. And again, by a five to four decision, uh, the Supreme Court reversed that. Uh, at least they reversed it. Uh, this is a nice little distinction for mature universities. I guess you can say that uh, Emory and uh, I don't, ha don't have to worry about the University of Michigan. It's a, uh, uh, it's a public school and not subject to the National Labor Relations Act. But the Harvards and the Yales and the Stanfords, uh, they're all mature. And the reason is that uh, their faculty members run the university. Uh, they manage everything. Uh, I leave it to you, the faculty members out there, to whether you think you run everything. Uh, but that's the word of the Supreme Court. Um, I think this was a case in which we really were applying law to particular facts. And of course, I think the administrative the decision of the NLRB uh, should have been sustained on that basis. A case that uh, uh, Jack Getman has already spoken about, the problem of union access to employees. Uh, here you can see really a confrontation, as uh, Jack has already spoken, about the rights of employers to run their property, maintain their control, versus the rights of employees and unions uh, to organize. And to what extent uh, should there be uh, uh, a right even to get on employer property as a means of trying to reach the employees? <clears throat> Long ago, the Supreme Court laid out a general principle uh, to the effect that if the workforce was isolated, uh, we're talking about some resort hotel uh, up in the Catskills or some plant way out in the boondocks, uh, then the uh, union may be entitled to get into the plant's parking lots and other areas at least that are sort of generally open. Recently there was a, a, a case, the Leachmere case, the Leachmere case in which uh, the board uh, panel that happened to be solely controlled, that panel was fully appointed by President Reagan, uh, decided that in a urban area uh, where uh, uh, the traffic was very heavy, uh, union organizers were entitled to enter onto a parking lot that was open to the public and jointly owned uh, by the employer. And uh, the uh, board had held that in this situation, when other avenues of communication were not uh, open, easily available, uh, that the, uh, the union organizers had that right the Supreme Court reversed. I think we're talking about a six to three decision. The Supreme Court, uh, uh, Justice Scalia uh, speaking, no, it was Justice Thomas, excuse me. Justice Thomas uh, said that there are other ways. Uh, they put advertisements in newspapers. Uh, uh, they could uh, have a meeting at the uh, Union Hall, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I'll uh, second my colleague uh, Jack Getman in saying it's too bad it seems to me that uh, the Labor Board doesn't have uh, more capacity to provide empirical support. Uh, Justice Thomas was prepared to say that there was no showing, it's all speculative, as to whether the unions couldn't adequately reach other employees uh, uh, reach employees through other means. Why not have the Labor Board provide empirical evidence? Now here there's the nasty little provision in the Taft-Hartley Act 
that says there cannot be any special department set up on the NLRB to provide economic data. But it seems to me that uh, some empirical data, socio-psychological, uh, ought to be something that the board could do, uh, handle adeptly without setting up any separate department and uh, help convince Justice Thomas that in today's urban world, uh, where employees uh, disperse all over the area, uh, that simply doesn't uh, work to advertise or try to get them to leave the barbecues and come to a town meeting sort uh, at the uh, uh, union headquarters. Consumer picketing. Uh, there's a very famous case that's come to be called, known as tree fruits in which uh, uh, employees were allowed to uh, picket in front of a large uh, supermarket where one single product uh, was non-union and the um, uh, pickets made very clear to the public, you can pass our picket line, don't hesitate, told the Teamsters to make all kinds of deliveries. This is a pure consumer appeal. And uh, there the labor board, for reasons that are quite understandable under the rather technical language of the uh, National Labor Relations Act as amended in 1959 in the Landrum Griffin Act, uh, decided that that was a secondary boycott. It was a secondary boycott. And here the US Supreme Court uh, reversed, uh, concluding that there were constitutional issues in this picture. Remember, this is addressed to individual members of the consuming public, not to union persons as a group. And in that case, the uh, the court uh, uh, went to the, overruled, reversed the uh, labor board's decision. It does seem to me that here we are dealing with one of those pure questions of law, and no deference should have been paid. The next case, I think again, no deference should have been paid. I would have come out differently on the result, but uh, in the next case that came along, the Safeco case, here, this involved uh, insurance. Uh, here, the secondary parties, so to speak, were persons 90% of whose business, 90% of whose business uh, was uh, in the insurance of the primary product. And there, the labor board, uh, again, quite arguably correctly, on the basis of the language of the, uh, the statute, uh, concluded that that was a secondary boycott and they distinguished the earlier tree fruits case uh, on the ground that that case, uh, uh, there was such a small impact upon the secondary retailers uh, business because only one product, Washington State apples in a big supermarket uh, was being affected and uh, so distinguished. The Supreme Court in this case uh, agreed, and uh, they were prepared to make the same argument, that uh, the likelihood of coercion of the secondary party, when 90% of its business uh, was involved, was too great. Now, uh, I would argue in this case with the dissenters, uh, who interestingly enough simply relied on tree fruits and didn't talk enough in my estimation about the Constitution. We're talking about an appeal to individual consuming members of the public, not to the union as an organization, not to union members who might react as a group, but to individual consumers. I see absolutely no difference between putting uh, a sign on a stick, and actually some of them they just drape signs over the shoulders of wizened old men and women to avoid the coercive element. Uh, see no difference between that and an unfair list in a newspaper. Uh, Archibald Cox, once before uh, he became Solicitor General and had to officially take another position, he agreed that ultimately it should be concluded that pure consumer picketing uh, ought to be equated with the unfair list in a newspaper, and that, it seems to me, is the kind of legal rule that the where the court should prevail. Uh, I'm going to omit any discussion of the posting of notices. That surely to come up somewhere today in the interest of time. I'm being heckled by our good chairman here. And let me just close with the overall notion uh, that I really do think that Chevron uh, is too blunt an instrument 
uh, to prevail in all these cases, that it doesn't really take account of all the myriad factors that may need to go be taken into account in deciding whether how a court in reviewing an administrative agency should act. I do think that old Skidmore, multifaceted, flexible, is actually, and it's been revived today, is more likely to provide guidance uh, to a court uh, trying to decide to what extent should a court uh, be prepared to defer to or to reverse uh, the decision uh, of an administrative agency. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, Charlotte, Professor Charlotte Garden. So let me first just add my voice to the chorus of thanks to Emory Law School, to the editors of the Emory Law Journal for their um, tireless work and professionalism in putting together the symposium. Um, also to Professor Michael Green for putting together um, this group of, of people who I'm so honored to be sharing a, a symposium and a panel with. Um, Professor Wilson's description of, of them as iconic was, is exactly right. Just so many people who I admire. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm really incredibly looking forward to the, to the board's talk coming up next. So the title of my talk in the, in the printed program um, begins with the, the quote, a shot across the bow, um, which is a phrase that's been used sort of a number of times um, regarding the board by people expressing both support and opposition to things that the board is doing. Um, but in my case was a reference to a quote from Senator Lindsey Graham, um, who used the phrase in reference to his proposal um, to partially defund the board so it could not pursue an unfair labor practice complaint against Boeing, um, of course, a major employer in my home state of Washington. So to me, the statement now stands for the idea that seemingly modest or even routine decisions or actions taken by the board um, can result in rather extreme reactions. And I think there are all sorts of reasons for this, um, including that with private sector union density hovering around six and a half percent, people just aren't routinely familiar with the operation of labor law. And then closely related, um, there's no longer a general social consensus that employers' reactions to workers' collective action um, is really any business of the government's. And this lack of consensus isn't limited to the public. Uh, it's also present uh, among the other two branches of government, um, which of course play a role in determining uh, how and when the board functions. So this brings me to the board's two recent rulemakings, um, which I want to discuss for the remainder of my talk today, um, focusing on reaction to board rulemakings by the other branches. Um, and what they mean for rulemaking's effectiveness considering the burdens that it imposes on the agency. So first, calls for the board to exercise its rulemaking authority have been more or less continuous for 40 years, maybe longer, um, including some from some academics late, uh, who are in this room. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the reasons for those calls for rulemaking momentarily. Um, and then I want to use the board's two recent experiences with rulemaking as kind of case studies to talk about the extent to which the board's been able to realize the anticipated process benefits of rulemaking in this politically uh, contentious environment. So I want to spend a lot of time describing the rules themselves. I think some folks are gonna talk about them in greater detail later today. Um, but of course, I'm referring to first the notice posting rule, which would have required employers to post a brief description of employees' rights to act collectively and would have imposed penalties for noncompliance. And second, the election procedures rule, which makes a set of adjustments to existing election procedures generally resulting in a shorter and more streamlined process. But of course, the notice posting rule is not in force. Um, it was withdrawn after being struck down by the DC Circuit on compelled speech grounds and the Fourth Circuit on statutory and administrative law grounds. And the election procedures rule is set to take effect soon, uh, though it's been challenged in two pending cases and is also the subject of a joint resolution under the Congressional Review Act. And much of the discourse surrounding this rule has been focused on employer speech and employee privacy, um, possibly to the surprise of some of the rule's earliest proponents, um, but more on that later. 
So to preview the end of the talk, it looks to me like in the current political environment, the process benefits of rulemaking are, are real, but they're tempered by the seemingly outsized risk of invalidation um, when one considers the, the, con the relatively modest contents of the rule. Um, which in turn feeds a political narrative of an out of control board, right, a vicious cycle of overreactions, um, in my view, to what the board is doing. And what's especially interesting, I think, is the injection of free speech arguments into the controversy over both rulemakings. Um, because these speech arguments just have so much resonance with the public, I think they especially turn up the volume on the debate. So to go back, I want to start with the calls for rulemaking. Uh, so for decades, academics and courts have debated the relative merits of rulemaking and adjudication, um, given that agencies are generally free to choose between the two. Uh, with the conventional wisdom um, about the advantages of adjudication being that it increases um, speed and flexibility, um, it results in less chance of attracting political heat to the agency. Um, in addition, courts might be less likely to overturn gradual change brought about through repeated adjudications, and there's um, perhaps less at stake in terms of input man hours when a court rejects a decision rather than a rule. But in the context of the NLRB, debate is a bit of a misnomer, right? The calls for rulemaking have been more or less unanimous. Um, so I'll roughly kind of categorize the benefits of rulemaking that others have advanced, particularly in the context of the board, um, and then talk about each in the context of these two recent rulemakings. So I'll start with the idea that rulemaking yields more and better information, um, and that encompasses uh, both the ideas that the notice and comment process results in a more complete record on which to make a decision um, with the likelihood of greater volume of participation, right? The idea being that it's lower cost to submit a comment than something like filing an amicus brief. And also the idea that greater participation is good for its own sake in the sense that more democratic deliberation might lead to a greater consensus that the final product is legitimate. And indeed, a huge number of comments were filed in each of the two recent rulemakings, um, 7,000 some in the case of the notice posting rule, tens of thousands, 65,000 in the election procedures rule. Um, still, I think it's hard to say that the comments resulted in substantively more useful information than the board typically receives in its highest profile adjudications, um, particularly those where the board issues a detailed call for amicus briefs. Um, those calls seem to often fulfill the statutory requirements of a notice of proposed rulemaking, for example, and result in fairly comprehensive submissions. I think that's probably also in part because labor law seems to be an area in which the big sophisticated groups on each side do a pretty good job of representing the spectrum of views that their constituencies hold, or perhaps their constituencies hold relatively consistent views. Um, those groups will participate through any means available, right, be they amicus briefs or be they comments or something else. Still, rulemaking could still result in greater public legitimacy. Uh, it's probably impossible to say in any individual case whether the public would have regarded either a board rulemaking or an adjudication as being more democratically legitimate if it had been the result of the other process. Um, but it certainly hasn't been the case that rulemakings have avoided charges of illegitimacy in their final results, right? Strong and politically polarized uh, reactions follow both processes. And while it's common for critics to argue that adjudications should have been rulemakings, uh, rulemakings are certainly not immune to process arguments either. Uh, so for example, one argument for striking down the rule regarding bargaining units in acute care hospitals was that a rule couldn't take into account all of the granular differences across different hospitals that could be taken into account in a case-by-case -case process. So given, that the, so given the board's practices in the adjudicative context, coupled with the fact that a narrative of board illegitimacy seems sort of inevitable, um, and certainly independent from the choice of procedural vehicle, um, I'm not sure that this set of rulemaking process benefits has really come to fruition. Okay, second, um, rulemaking is a forward-looking process. Uh, it's not confined by the topics that happen to come along and give rise to cases. And rulemaking can more easily be brought in scope. Uh, related to this set of reasons, due process and fairness considerations can prevent the application of new principles to the parties in a given case. So decisions that change the law sometimes get sort of partially repurposed as policy statements in a way that sits a bit awkwardly with the commonly understood, understood purposes of adjudication. Okay, so the, I think the election rule is a great example of these benefits. 
Uh, well, the board can and does adjust some aspects of its election procedures by other methods, by, through adjudication, through simply changing its own internal practice. Uh, the board just couldn't make a suite of simultaneous changes through any mechanism but rulemaking. Um, and of course, the procedures that are set forth in the CFR can't be changed by other board processes. Furthermore, compliance with a single rule that clearly sets forth the new process is, is much easier, especially for an unrepresented party, than tracking a series of decisions and internal process changes that might be located all over the place. But then at the same time, it's the comprehensive nature of the rule that ratchets up public and judicial attention. Uh, so the crux of the pending lawsuits aimed at invalidating the election procedures rule um, are that the changes taken together deprive employers of adequate opportunity to oppose a union drive. And while employers likely would have uh, challenged smaller piecemeal changes as well, um, their charge would have had less force in the context of those smaller incremental steps. So that's not to say I agree with the charge in the context of the, of the pending rule. I think Professor Hirsch will talk about that on the next panel. So I think both sides of this piece of the conventional wisdom about adjudication and rulemaking seem to be true um, in that the board's rulemaking, when it takes effect, will have significantly greater impact than a more piecemeal course of action um, could have. Um, but the price is increased vulnerability to lawsuits and congressional review and greater cost in terms of lost effort and possible rhetorical backlash if those challenges ultimately succeed. And then a final set of reasons advanced for more board rulemaking includes stability and consistency. So rulemaking can bring clarity to complex areas of law and, uh, and the greater investment of time in rulemaking could perhaps mean that later reversals by the agency itself are less likely. In addition, there's greater um, possibility that rulemaking can accommodate policy judgments by the agency while also being overseen by Congress. It seems a bit premature at this point to comment on how the two recent rules would play out in this regard, given that one was withdrawn and the other has yet to take effect. Uh, but there's at least one interesting um, procedural wrinkle, um, that's th and that's that when the board announces a prospective application only rule via an adjudication, it often isn't appealable in the immediate case because the party that would oppose the new rule actually wins under the old rule. So the new rule doesn't become appealable until it's actually applied in other cases, um, at which point the case goes directly to a circuit court rather than starting in a district court like a challenge to a rule would. So adjudicated rules are perhaps more likely to be reviewed as applied rather than facially, um, whereas in contrast, the, both recent rules were subject to facial challenges before they took effect, albeit with some significant justiciability issues um, in the case of the suits challenging the election procedures rule. So I think that cuts a number of ways in terms of which process promotes stability or certainty. Um, but I think there's something to be said for as applied challenges giving courts a chance to see how law actually operates as the Supreme Court's re repeatedly observed in the constitutional context. And perhaps that applies with greater force in the context of the, of the NLR A as so many judges um, don't have perhaps an intuitive working um, knowledge of how union elections work. It would be helpful to see um, how these rules apply to an actual party. Finally, I had mentioned earlier the, incre the seemingly increased salience of, of free speech arguments, and of course those are external to the choice of rulemaking or adjudication, except in as much as the stakes are just higher in the rulemaking context. So I want to just briefly use the election procedures rule as an example of what I mean here. So several of the calls for board rulemaking um, in, in prior years have specifically suggested rulemaking in order to streamline the elections process. As far as I can tell, that discussion did not anticipate at all that one, of, that one source of opposition to the rule would be the argument that shortening the time between when, and when a union files for an election and when the election is ultimately held um, violates employers' free speech rights. So in a way, it's not tremendously surprising to me that those arguments weren't anticipated. Um, uh, you know, and again, I'm talking about in sort of prior prior decades, um, because the argument there um, that the argument that there's a free speech interest in statutory or regulatory baselines that regulate the timing of an election was only developed recently, um, and in light of relatively recent developments in First Amendment law that increase the scrutiny of economic regulation that happened to involve speech in cases like US v. United Foods and IMS v. Sorrell. 
So we'll know soon if, if this argument will gain traction in the courts, um, but to the extent that courts continue to be receptive to these arguments, the resulting judicial bottleneck will mean that rulemaking in particular carries for outsized risks. So I should wrap up here, um, but all this leaves me with the view that uh, when the board has a choice between the two processes, uh, the process benefits of rulemaking alone don't necessarily provide a compelling reason to choose that process, at least in the current uh, political and judicial environment. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Garden. Uh, last but not least, uh, we'll hear from Professor Bill Gould. And we'll try and uh, save a few minutes at the end of the presentations for uh, questions from the audience. Again, I want to uh, reiterate which is w what has been said so many times now already, and that is uh, how uh, grateful I am to uh, both Professor Green and to the uh, Emory Law School and Law Journal, uh, and uh, uh, to the dean for uh, a very uh, 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 cohesive and articulate uh, introduction to the subject and his uh, uh, reference to uh, the New Deal Constitution, the New Deal Constitution. Um, because, of course, uh, this year, 2015, is um, uh, not simply one in which uh, we, we celebrate or uh, uh, commemorate the uh, 80th anniversary of the National Labor Relations Act. This year of 2015 is one in which we see 800 years of uh, Magna Carta uh, beginning in uh, 1215, which uh, labor leaders spoke so often about uh, prior to the National Labor Relations Act as the basis for establishing uh, rights uh, for uh, working people. It is the 150th anniversary of the great, uh, of the period of the great uh, Civil War uh, amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th uh, amendments, which uh, uh, not only have their uh, 20th century uh, analog in the Voting Rights Act, uh, uh, limited as it is by Supreme Court uh, decisions, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, but, uh, uh, but uh, other uh, modern uh, legislation uh, like uh, uh, the National Labor Relations Act, uh, which uh, it has some of the same purposes. This is 150 years uh, since we, uh, 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 since uh, really the results of those post-Civil War amendments were truly ratified uh, and, uh, and anticipated in the case of the 14th and 15th uh, through uh, Appomattox, uh, signed, I think, uh, this very day, 150 uh, years ago. Um, 80 years of the National Labor Relations Act and the role of politics, which is really uh, my uh, subject. Uh, um, uh, uh, a uh, uh, union lawyer with whom I was speaking before uh, uh, this talk said, well, that's a very short speech, uh, the role of politics. Of course, <laughs> there's a role of politics in the uh, National Labor Relations Act and the uh, National Labor Relations uh, Board. And of course, we can see the polarization and uh, the impasse that has emerged uh, in the labor arena uh, mirrored uh, uh, by uh, the Supreme Court's uh, recent decisions, the uh, new process uh, uh, decision uh, in which uh, the court, uh, um, uh, in the wake of the events of uh, 2007, 2008, 2009 uh, uh, declared that, uh, uh, that uh, the, the board was acting without a, um, a proper quorum within the meaning of the act and the Noel Canning decision of uh, last summer in which uh, the board, in which the Supreme Court held that uh, um, uh, President uh, Obama's uh, recess appointments, while they could be made both uh, uh, intercession and intrasession, uh, recesses uh, were unconstitutional because they did not comport with uh, historical uh, with historical practice. Um, uh, 
but of course, uh, in the interim, uh, as uh, 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 the, the Senator Reid had uh, worked his uh, will uh, in the summer of 2013 uh, by uh, eliminating uh, the filibuster uh, in the Senate uh, with regard to appointments and with regard to appointments to the National Labor Relations Board uh, as well. Um, Senator Kennedy said to me in a, in a letter that he sent to me after I was confirmed by the uh, Senate, uh, good thing the Republicans decided not to filibuster. Um, and uh, uh, because, of course, that became a, uh, uh, a weapon, weapon. And in some regard, uh, what the, you know, we should really think of, we talk about Wagner and Taft-Hartley, we should really today in 2015 uh, talk about uh, Senator Reid uh, uh, because of uh, what, the, what happened in the Senate. Because if it wasn't for what Senator, Senator Reid was able to do in the summer of 2013, uh, Noel Canning would have uh, much more considerable significance than uh, it does. Um, uh, the, in the beginning, uh, perhaps uh, uh, the, 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 the matters, the issues, uh, were not uh, uh, as uh, polarized, or at least as visibly polarized, uh, notwithstanding uh, the fact the, the the fact that there could be no elections held uh, virtually during the first two years of the National Labor Relations Act because of the uh, Jones uh, and Laughlin uh, uh, statute, but the uh, Jones and Laughlin uh, Humphrey executor. Uh, which came down, which held that uh, in 1935 uh, that uh, uh, the president could not uh, remove um, uh, individuals appointed with specific terms in independent agencies which were to emerge in the wake of Humphreys, uh, like uh, the uh, National Labor Relations Board, uh, seemed to uh, uh, extol uh, the idea of this pristine uh, uh, idea of, uh, of, uh, of independence. Um, uh, there, were no, uh, there were no division of uh, uh, appointments uh, between uh, parties. Um, that was to emerge much later. We don't know precisely when this custom, not written into the National Labor Relations Act as it is in other regulatory statutes uh, of a 3-2 divide uh, between the parties got, it got its, um, uh, has its origins uh, in the National Labor Relations Act. Even Professor James Gross, uh, the leading historian of the board, uh, uh, states that he is unaware when this uh, uh, really happened, uh, but it exists uh, uh, today. And uh, uh, there was, uh, uh, no, um, uh, there, there was no uh, division as there is in Japan between management and labor representatives, although management uh, labor lawyers were appointed at a very early point. I think uh, uh, Gerald Riley, uh, being the first of the uh, management uh, lawyers, uh, union lawyers, not to follow until my board uh, in 1994 when member Bra Browning was appointed by uh, uh, President uh, Clinton. So, uh, independence. Um, uh, in the wake of Humphreys, uh, a separation of the board from the executive branch. Secretary of Labor Francis Perkins wanted the board to be part of the Department of Labor. Uh, and uh, really, of course, uh, uh, within uh, the influence of uh, appointed officials of the president. Uh, uh, out of Humphreys uh, came the uh, idea that uh, no, the uh, board and uh, other agencies would be uh, separated. But even though uh, politics seemed to be uh, diminished or, or minimized at this particular time, of course, the seeds uh, were there because of the opaque and open-ended 
necessarily perhaps uh, ambiguous language of the statute subject to different interpretations by different people. The, the examples are, I won't repeat all the examples that have been provided uh, uh, for us uh, uh, today and, uh, uh, and of course terms of limited duration. Uh, through which uh, uh, the president of the day could uh, theoretically influence uh, uh, labor policy in the future um, uh, during his term through appointments. Um, we didn't begin to see uh, the, the more visible divide in the board itself into, until the Eisenhower administration, uh, which uh, displaced the Roosevelt-Truman hegemony, uh, in terms of uh, uh, appointments and uh, uh, a new Eisenhower board, the Eisenhower administration being composed of uh, nine, million, nine millionaires and a plumber, uh, uh, with uh, Durkin be appoint being appointed Secretary of Labor and uh, uh, Eisenhower's appoint appointee being uh, uh, Chairman Guy F uh, Farmer, um, a, a, a new uh, uh, general counsel and uh, uh, the philosophy of uh, of um, uh, of decentralization, a withdrawal of jurisdiction, which of course culminated in Gus against Utah Labor Relations Board, uh, the unconstitutionality of the uh, of uh, the assertion of jurisdiction by the states in the new no man's land, the reversal of of uh, previously established decisions, uh, captive audience interrogation um, of employees, uh, uh, free speech uh, uh, issues uh, arising under uh, HC, secondary boycotts, uh, as well as uh, uh, lockouts. And then the, and, and of course, uh, the Kraft severance cases, which uh, uh, promoted the interests of the American Federation of Labor at the expense of the Congress of Industrial Organizations. And then the Kennedy Board, um, which uh, 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 prompted Professor Meltzer uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the University of Chicago to talk about the board as, as an agency on a seesaw uh, going back and forth, the reversal of uh, Eisenhower board decisions by uh, uh, Kennedy uh, in some of the uh, areas that we have, uh, the Kennedy board and some of the areas that we've spoken of, President Kennedy able to secure a new majority very quickly through the appointment of uh, Chairman McCulloch uh, and uh, uh, Member Brown in the uh, spring of, uh, of 19, uh, uh, 1961 and to establish and call back um, uh, cases uh, uh, involving uh, the contracting out of work and the question of whether or not uh, uh, employers would be uh, obliged to bargain uh, about it. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the board uh, winning a partial uh, victory uh, in the early uh, fiber board case before the uh, Supreme Court. And also uh, picketing, organizational picketing, where uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the strictures of uh, newly enacted 8B7 of the Landrum-Griffin Act uh, become uh, part of the Landrum-Griffin Amendments uh, become um, uh, a, uh, uh, a basis for uh, 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 promoting uh, a, a, a protests about uh, working working conditions. Um, but still, we we um, we don't have uh, at this particular time a. Uh, the, the polarization uh, and uh, divide that uh, seems to have uh, uh, set in now. And I would say that uh, um, without going into too much uh, uh, detail about it, that it really uh, probably begins uh, in the early 1980s, uh, uh, um, in the late 1970s, in connection with uh, some of uh, President Carter's uh, nominees uh, 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 when, uh, uh, for the first time, uh, there is a, uh, 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 how many minutes do I have? Five minutes. Okay. All right. And so uh, uh, I, so uh, 
this, this, this divide really begins in the, uh, in the late uh, 70s when uh, General Counsel Lubbers and, uh, um, and uh, board member uh, uh, Truesdale are uh, uh, attacked. Uh, um, the, um, um, uh, in the 1980s, uh, the new uh, Reagan board, uh, which, uh, uh, which formulates uh, which again moves uh, the board by way of doctrine, but really primarily because of its backlog and the difficulty in uh, getting uh, prompt relief prom promotes, uh, encourages the AFL-CIO uh, to say for the first time that maybe it's better not to have any uh, 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 statute uh, at all. Um, and uh, uh, then... Um, uh, the kindler, gentler, gentler Bush One board, and finally uh, my board, uh, penultimately my board, which uh, 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 of course is uh, uh, is dealing with the most political of all the cases, the the political uh, dues cases, the Beck cases, which uh, uh, none of which got decided until um, uh, we came to town in the uh, in the 1990s and. Uh, 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 the use of the unprecedented use of Section 10J uh, of the Act, uh, attempting to get uh, injunctive relief, uh, which um, attracted considerable attention on the part of uh, Congress, uh, circumscribed appropriations, got uh, uh, Congress so interested in appointments that for a couple of years uh, I was the only confirmed member of the one member of the uh, board, the other two uh, for periods of time serving as, uh, as a recess uh, appointees. The September massacre, as it has come to be called by some, uh, of the Bush II, uh, the younger Bush uh, uh, board, um, which uh, uh, leads to where the Democrats say, we're not going to play this batching game at all. See, now we have not only the three-two divide between the parties uh, uh, not provided for by statute, but we have also this new idea, which really came in in the Clinton era, uh, of batching with Senator Kassenbaum, Senator Tr uh, uh, Trot uh, 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 of uh, Mississippi, say that uh, we're not going to uh, appoint anybody unless you uh, appoint our uh, people as well. They become more directly involved in the, in the uh, process. Uh, much attention has been given to, uh, in the last talk, to uh, uh, the uh, Obama board. Uh, let me say um, uh, simply that uh, uh, what we have today, you know, for the first time we had Congressman Klein uh, 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 promote uh, and gain acceptance in the House of Representatives of his so-called ambush election law. This is with the first uh, law that I've been aware of which uh, uh, promoted the idea that the explicitly that the board ought not to act too quickly. You know, generally been talking about how can we expedite, how can we make uh, simpler? And uh, the idea was, well, um, similar to the problems that we faced in connection with postal ballots in the 1990s. No, no, how can we promote um, uh, employer uh, free speech, employer captive audiences, even though the preamble of the act does not uh, speak uh, of them. Um, today, if we look at this tension between uh, politics and law, uh, we see, I think, uh, uh, a shift a shift from uh, the appointments, uh, politics being fought over in connection with the appointments process, that is pretty much immunized, or relatively speaking, immunized by virtue of uh, Senator Reid in the summer of 2013. No more filibusters. Uh, no more, uh, perhaps, uh, theoretically anyway, no more batching. Uh, majority rule. Now, of course, uh, uh, this will all be academic uh, with regard to this, this particular Senate, but uh, should there be a different Senate in the future, uh, the, the filibuster uh, would be very ac academic. But as, as the ability to affect appointments is diminished, 
by what happened in the summer of 2013, we have really gaining uh, uh, ascendancy the view that it's not the board, as the Supreme Court said in the Garmin case in 1959, that is this new expert that was supposed to be a surrogate for and displace uh, the bad old days of a judiciary which knew so little about labor management relations. It's not the board that is the expert, it's the Congress which is the expert uh, through, the through the Congressional Review Act, which uh, I must confess I paid little attention to at the time it was enacted during the Clinton administration. But now, as we can see by the events uh, uh, of the past few days in connection with uh, uh, the Congress uh, has become uh, front and center and very important, the Northwestern case involving the right of uh, the question of whether or not athletes will be viewed as employees within the meaning of the act, still pending before the board, but where the congressional, uh, where uh, more hearings are being held than ever and where Congress is saying, hey, if the board is able to do this, this will interfere with quality education as we, uh, as we know it today. It's the Congress that is the uh, uh, expert as their ability to influ influence uh, appointments has been uh, diminished, the divide that was always there has grown uh, uh, greater, uh, but it has uh, new manifestations in this year of 2015. Thank you, Professor Gould. We've got a few minutes before the break for questions. If anybody has a question, we ask that you would uh, go to the mic. Please address it to uh, whichever panel member you would like to respond, or if it's a question for the full panel. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I guess I address this uh, mostly to Professor Gould, but to the panel. Uh, you went through some Supreme Court decisions, new process, and canning, Channing. And then the uh, Supreme Court granted cert to two national right to work legal foundation cases in the 13-14 uh, session, which is 4% of their inventory about. Is the Supreme Court gunning for unions and trying to destroy them? Well, um, of course, um, uh, I didn't uh, uh, speak as, as in detail on the uh, range of uh, decisions uh, that the Supreme Court has handed uh, down. The Supreme Court, uh, even the Warren Court, if you, um, uh, if you look at the uh, Fiber Board and uh, uh, Gissel, um, has uh, through um, Indifference, uh, uh, I don't know the uh, principal motivating uh, factor, uh, uh, first national maintenance where in the 1980s, uh, where the court went out of its way to say uh, that uh, labor and management uh, under our uh, uh, philosophy were not to be, uh, could not be viewed as, uh, as partners, I suppose picking up on uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, Justice uh, Brennan's uh, um, uh, American, insur uh, American insurance language uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the insurance case in 1960, uh, 1960, where he talked so much about an adversarial relationship between labor and management. The Supreme Court, I think, has been... Um, um, uh, uh, at a minimum, poorly informed. Now, we have had uh, this uh, Harris against Quinn decision, not involving uh, the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, um, and uh, uh, it's quite obvious that uh, uh, there are at least four members. Um, we don't know uh, who, who uh, have the view that uh, 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 union security agreements which compel uh, dues as a condition of employment in the public sector 
uh, are unconstitutional under the First Amendment. Uh, we don't know quite where Justice Scalia is. The good news is that, uh, um, that Justice Scalia uh, uh, leaves the outcome of uh, Harris against Quinn a little ambiguous. The bad news is that Justice Scalia will tip the balance in cases that are to come. And, and uh, of course, the National Right to Work Foundation is bringing um, a number of them uh, now. I think the court has been uh, uh, backward, um, and uh, yeshiva has been uh, mentioned. Uh, we wouldn't, uh, you know, it's very funny, Stanford at the, at the time that yeshiva was decided uh, was taking uh, a, um, uh, a very aggressive position on the age, on the applicability of the Age Discrimination Act to uh, universities. Uh, uh, the, uh, nothing involving the Age Discrimination Act and the question of whether university professors could be compelled to retire at a particular age uh, came before the faculty senate that I'm aware of. Uh, and uh, uh, the, um, the court has been, I think, uh, uh, quite backward and uh, unsympathetic to uh, free unions and to the preamble of the National Labor Relations Act itself. Yeah, Professor I, Getman is... Yeah, I, I, would agree with, <laughs> I would agree with that. I don't think the, the court has an agenda to destroy unions, but I think they have a bunch of opinions and attitudes which point them very much in, in a different di direction in most situations. Uh, in particular, an, uh, an appreciation and a feeling of the necessity to defend property rights. With regard to the, to the Harris and Quinn and these decisions on union security, this court you know, sees itself as a great defender of the First Amendment. So you give you know, First Amendment rights to corporations but not, but so far not to unions, but to all sorts of people like the Hillsborough Baptist. And the court sees the people who don't join unions as, as workers of conscience, whose conscience would be affronted by having to pay for the benefits that they get. Of course, the workers, this is a perfect example in a way of the, if this isn't exactly ignorance, but it's no sense of how workers feel about people who don't pay their share, the free riders. Uh, to the court, this is another chance to expand the First Amendment. But I do think that if you could ever get a, a favorable opinion from this court that would be supportive of the, of the policies we've all mentioned, it would be to use the, their sense of the First Amendment as, uh, and turn it. Because when you think about it, none of the secondary boycott laws are immune from First Amendment attack. Section 8B7 is all about separating picketing, which the court has repeatedly said is a form of free speech in every case except where unions are involved. And then they say picketing is more than free speech. It involves patrol of an area, or words that mean essentially nothing. But I, I would hope that the board can present again uh, some of these issues. It would have to be carefully done, but to the court uh, and say, <clears throat> you are the champions of the First Amendment, and certainly Justice Robert, Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, kind of wears that mantle very proudly. I'd like to give them a chance in the situation of unions to say, well, why is Everybody else is picketing legitimate, but our picketing is more than free speech. But, but here's, here's the thing, by the way, vis-a-vis -vis Harris against Quinn. Uh, the Supreme Court said in Garcetti that uh, public employees have no First Amendment rights involving the workplace. Uh, their only First Amendment rights uh, are outside the workplace uh, in talking about matters as uh, the public school teachers did in Pickering of, uh, of general public concern. Yet, 
it is the it is the First Amendment rights within the workplace that seem to be driving the view of uh, at least four and probably five members of the court in Harris against Quinn. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, my name is Bennett Alsher. Just a quick question to any of you. You were talking about the conflict between the courts and the board, and Professor St. Antoine, you talked about deference in certain cases and not in others. What about a situation where you have the board, which has come out with a rule and a case that's uh, been overturned in D.R. Horton by the Fifth Circuit, and every circuit court that has heard D.R. Horton uh, has has rejected it, uh, has rejected the board's position in D.R. Horton, and yet the board in Murphy Oil has now come out and reasserted its position over in a 3-2 dissent. My question is, what do you do when the board ignores uh, the circuit courts, and how do you <clears throat> justify the board's taking a position that no circuit court has accepted yet? But the well, board that's, a, that's a very good point. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the board has always taken the position, and I think it's generally accepted, that until the Supreme Court uh, speaks, uh, it is not bound, except in the given circuit uh, where the question has been answered for that particular circuit. So that's the philosophy behind it. The, the attitudes of the two courts that, uh, that first came out, I thought were very interesting and very strange in a way. The District of Columbia felt that re requiring the notice to be posted for a particular employer, these are notices, by the way, for anybody who's not aware of it, uh, describing for non-union employees in non-union plants what their rights to organize might be. And of course, they have those rights. In fact, they can exercise many of these rights without any union, such as the right to strike. Uh, but in any event, uh, the DC Circuit first held uh, that uh, this was contrary to the free speech right, of, uh, which is embodied in the uh, Section 8C of the National Labor Relations Act, usually thought to sort of reflect a constitutional right. But in any event, uh, I myself find it very hard to see how letting uh, the uh, notice be posted by the board, which everybody realizes is a board pronouncement, in some fashion is forcing an employer uh, to speak in a way it does not wish to speak. I don't understand that argument at all. The Fourth Circuit uh, here uh, makes much more sense in what it has to say that uh, the Labor Board is generally not a self-initiating body. It depends upon the filing of representation petitions or unfair labor practice charges before it ordinarily goes into action. That's an interesting point. Uh, it also has to be noted that at about the time the National Labor Relations Act was enacted, there were a lot of other administrative agencies who were also being established. And many of them were, in fact, given a specific right uh, to post notices about the, uh, the rights, for example, under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And so one can say that the absence of any such uh, uh, delegation to the National Labor Relations Board uh, could be an example of one of these expressio unius, it, it was provided for the others but not for this, so on. Uh, I myself would say, uh, and here of course I naturally provide my own bias, uh, that uh, one could make a very decent argument, it seems to me, that it's so fundamental to m uh, promulgate what clearly are statutory rights so that the ignorant would learn about these things. So many non-union people have no notion of what rights they have, and it seems to me that one could really argue that this is something that ought to be allowed as simply an inherent power of an agency having jurisdiction over a particular area and to be able to promulgate to the people affected through the most effective means possible, which of course is not some federal regulation that nobody ever looks at, but a notice posted in the particular plants where those employees work. I'd like to say a word about D.R. Horton. I think this represents the Labor Board at its best. I think that was an excellent opinion. I think that the threat to workers' rights in a variety of cases from the Supreme Court's decisions in Concepcion and then um, the American Express case 
needs to be offset. This is the board actually performing the role that it's supposed to perform. And until the Supreme Court says they're wrong, I very much hope they will continue to pursue it. Um, I have been a long critic of the board uh, in most of my writings. I've rarely said anything good about them, but I think that <laughs> I, I think that D.R. Horton is the board really doing what it's supposed to what it's supposed to do. The opinions, read the, I, I can't believe that anybody could read the Fifth Circuit opinion on that case and think that, thank goodness, we have these wise judges uh, passing on the decision by the National Labor Relations Board. I don't think the Supreme Court is going to uphold that decision, uh, Jack. <laughs> well, the hour is late, and I understand that we have a break, and uh, we've got the other panel, so. One, let, let's reserve that one because it's almost, I'm sure, at almost 11 o'clock, so I'm sure that the panelists will make themselves available during the break. Thank you for everyone's attention. We're going to take 10 minutes and then we'll come back. <laughs>